welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Rowena Itchel, CEO, and with me, as always, is Tim Anaya, Vice President of Marketing and Communications. So, Tim, you just came back from what sounds like a, a wonderful vacation. Yes, I am tanned, rested, and ready, or really more sunburned and tired from flying. But uh, I uh, spent a beautiful week in Kauai last week. By the magic of podcasting, you didn't know I was gone, but I was gone. Uh, and it was lovely. I'd never been before. You know, we we had a little bit of that. You know, they say when it rains in Hawaii, you know, you have that rain for an hour or two and then it passes. And that really was the case. We had one day a pretty good downpour. And I thought, oh, is that going to mess up our plans for the afternoon? But sure enough, within 90 minutes, it was sunny again. Um, stayed at a beautiful resort on, on, on the beach and had a lovely view of the ocean and the ocean waves to wake up to every morning. And we saw all the sights. We got to go to the um, Opeaka Falls and see the waterfalls. We got to uh, see the Fern Grotto. We got to go to a luau. So we did all the great things. We went to the Kauai Museum, which was very interesting to learn all about the history of the island. I learned that Kauai is one of the only islands to have never been conquered. They actually agreed to be absorbed or however it was from, from the Hawaiians who tried multiple times to conquer them and it did not work. So, and then I learned all about Prince Kuhio, which this past weekend, was the Prince Kuhio parade and learned all about his time in, you know, growing up and, and, you know, all of the things that he did. So it was a very interesting, uh, relaxing trip. But bro, I understand while I was gone, you had a terrific luncheon with Philip Howard, which is the subject of our podcast today. That's right, Tim. And, and for those of you who missed it, especially those who are either out of state or, or in um, Northern California, we had a wonderful lunch with Philip Howard who, uh, as many of you know, he wrote a seminal book back in the 1990s called The Death of Common Sense. So his latest book is called Not Accountable. And it's about really the powerful unions, especially in this state, and rethinking how we could address a union power, especially with looking at constitutional issues. So it sounds wonky, but Philip does a great job in explaining his theory and what we can finally do to, to curb union power. Well, since I'm missed it. I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say. And I'm sure our listeners will enjoy uh, hearing his presentation as well. This is a longish podcast. So we're going to just go right into the podcast. Thanks everyone for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sally. And thank you for, for giving me the two hours to, uh, <laughs> to um, it is great to be down here. Um, I haven't, I think, I don't think I've been to LA since since before COVID, so it's um, it's nicer in LA than in the grime of New York City, which is where I live. So lucky you. So as Sally suggested, I've I've written this book. Um, I hadn't I didn't really set out to write the book, but I had a bet with a Yale law professor that I could prove that public unions were unconstitutional, and um, and started looking at the more I started out with the federal government, where the issue was actually quite. Um, uh, relatively simple. I wrote a law review article. The Trump people read it, um, decided I was right, and that was the basis for some of the stuff Trump had done. He tried to hire me but to do it, but I, um, I've known Trump for decades, and I did not want to work for Donald Trump. And um, uh, But the harder case is what to do with state and local unions. And so uh, I began thinking harder about how they actually work and what their effect on society is, and that's what this short book is about. And so the story is actually a recent story. Um, about 50 years ago, uh, for no good reason, and with almost no one noticing, uh, public employee unions were given collective bargaining power. They just were under, they kept pressuring the Democratic politicians to give them power, just to be just like the trade unions, they said, et cetera. So they gave them this power. No one noticed. And what that means is that the public, the government has to, is under a legal obligation to enter into a contract with one body that represents all the workers in a certain union that will govern the terms and conditions of employment. For 50 years, the unions have used this power, plus the incredible political clout 
from the organizing power of having collective bargaining to get more, more, more dues to effectively seize control of the operating systems of government. And the results are there for all to see. There is near zero accountability at all levels of government in this country. Um, there was an 18-year study in Illinois that showed out of 95,000 teachers, an average of two per year were dismissed for poor performance. Two out of 95,000. That's actually double the rate as in California. Uh, in, in, in the federal government, 99% of all federal employees get a fully successful rating. Because if you happen to put anything negative in a file, like doesn't try hard, they have the right to take the supervisor in, 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 into a public hearing. Now the effects, the harm of no accountability hasn't really been thought through very well. We think of it as, well, lots of lousy people in the schools or lots of lousy workers. I assume that most people who go into government do it or go into teaching do it for the right reasons. We have a daughter who's a teacher. She's completely devoted to her students. Um, but there are some who do a lousy job and who give up. But the worst problem is what the certainty of no accountability does to the culture of an organization. Because what it does is it removes the basis for mutual trust. So people come to work, they know that performance doesn't matter, so why go the extra mile? Why, why work a little harder? It's five o'clock, everybody else is leaving, I'm gonna leave too, even if there's something, something that, that, that needs, needs to get fixed. And so it's this, the corrosive effect on public culture is, is dramatically understated and it all stems from, from the lack of accountability. It's like letting the air out of a balloon. There's just nothing, nothing left there. And there are good schools, there are lots of good schools actually, and there are good agencies too, because a culture or leadership can trump this, a bad culture. But what it does is it makes it impossible to fix a bad organization. So recently Baltimore um, announced that it had 23 schools in Baltimore where not one student was proficient in reading. Not one student. Chicago found 50, no, 37 schools where not one student was proficient in either reading or math. So you're talking about completely failed organizations that no one can do anything about. The third problem with no accountability is that democracy is a process of accountability. That's all democracy is. You elect somebody, they do a lousy job. You elect somebody else or a different party, promise to do a good job. And of course, everybody runs on the basis that they're gonna make government work better. Change we can believe in, drain the swamp, you know, whatever. And it never happens. Well, why doesn't it happen? Because the people we elect as elected executives, the president, governors, mayors, no longer actually have the authority, the management tools to, to, to run government. Madison put it this way in the, in, in the constitutional debates, the lowest level, the middle level of employees and the highest grade must be accountable to the president. Accountability doesn't work if, unless it's an unbroken chain. So you elect someone today and you're electing basically a figurehead. You're electing somebody who can point fingers and blame people and try to change policy and can do certain things. And, and, and good leaders are better than bad leaders, but by and large, they don't have the basic, the main tool of, of governance, which is accountability. The next tool is manageability. So day to day, uh, people who run public agencies and schools have to deploy resources, make judgments about people, uh, account for new circumstances, problems. Uh, COVID comes along, how are you gonna deal with the children when the schools are closed? How long do you keep the schools closed? All these issues come up in small or large ways all the time. The unions have made it virtually impossible to manage public agencies. They're, the, I was looking at the LA Teachers Union contract, which I really encourage you to read. It's 400 and something pages long. It's uh, incredibly boring and detailed, but you only see consent that 
it fixes the time of days the teachers have to be there by the minute. There are only four meetings per month, maybe, with the principal. There are, you can't come observe a teacher um, except with advance notice and in certain situations. One, what you, uh, um, you, you need to close the school or to, you need to consolidate, to consolidate schools to conserve resources effectively. Um, you have to go through elaborate protocols. The union has a veto on almost anything. And seniority trumps quality all day long. You, you need to lay off somebody, you got to lay off the good younger teacher in order to keep the older. So the manageability issue, and I go through it in the book, are some of the stories are extraordinary. I mean, I had a friend who was deputy mayor in New York City who wanted to go around and ask um, member, you know, people working in the buildings department and such, you know, how to, how to do their jobs better. He was told that would be unlawful because that would be direct dealing. He can only talk with the union representative. So you're a manager. You can't even talk to your employees. So you have this distance learning. That's not in the contract. It's got to be negotiated. So again, you have these, so you have this veto. You get elected to run government and you have a, um, this body that you have to get to agree with you, and they're only thinking about their interest, not what's good for the public. And I'm not going to go into this much, but not, not only is government is unmanageable, but it's un unaffordable. Fifty years of negotiations, they've created gold-plated health benefits, pension plans, and the like, that have bloated the budgets so much that in, in certain jurisdictions, more spent for the for the to reserve for pension costs than it is for for the for the for the service itself. Um, I love the LA teachers going on sympathy strike for the for the bus drivers and service workers who, by the way, it's it's, it's not just a school problem. There is a problem in the society that there are a lot of people who work at these low grade jobs who don't make enough to support their families. So there is an issue there that society has to deal with. But why is the LA school district so strapped that it can't give these people a raise? Right, it's the teachers unions. So the teachers unions have these gold-plated contracts. David Crane estimated, he calculated in an email he sent around yesterday in Government for California, that merely by uh, requiring members of the union to take advantage of publicly available health plans like Medicare and other plans would save enough to give a $7,000 raise to every person in the LA school district. Just that one change. So we're talking about these, these incredibly bloated systems. So government is unmanageable and that means democracy is kind of a well, it's, it's theater. So democracy has become theater. We elect people who promise to do things, who, who, who have no power to do it. The, the mayor or the governor comes to office. The collective bargaining agreements are not coterminous with, the, with election terms. So he's bound by the, he or she's bound by the collective bargaining agreement. And then every five years or so, the collective bargaining agreement comes up for negotiation. And if there's a disagreement, depending on the state or jurisdiction, but in California, as I understand it, most jurisdictions, there's, if the union doesn't agree with what the elected executive elected by the voters wants, it then goes to arbitrators who are approved by the unions. So, so you have the situation, where are the voters? Literally, there's no, there's no link back, um, back to the, in New York State, as long as the stalemate continues, the collective bargaining agreement, as a matter of law, remains in force with all cost of living increases and such. So literally, it's like a perpetual, sort of like the Ten Commandments. So um, it's, it's this perpetual kind of obligation to do whatever this collective bargaining agreement does. In Illinois, recently, they passed a referendum, it's unbelievable, a constitutional provision in the state constitution that provides that collective bargaining agreements preempt any contrary past or present statute. 
I mean, past or future statute. So collective bargaining agreements basically override democracy again. I mean, it's so clearly uncommon. So we're already, I'm working on starting law, bringing lawsuits. We're already working on that lawsuit in, in Illinois. It's, so, so what I did, uh, so Sally has done this incredible job uh, for, for years at the at, at PRI. I mean, really, it's a fantastic organization that's diligent and relentless and don't get in her way kind of thing. Um, but the one thing I, th that I tried to do with this book that's different than the, all the critics of the unions have done over the years is look at it through the lens of constitutional governance. So we know it's a problem. We want to fight it. I love Dave, what David Crane is doing, you know, to fight, raising money to fight the unions and such. But how does this fit in with democracy? Well, it turns out that there's a very basic uh, constitutional principle that comes from John Locke's special treatise, uh, second treatise, that's called the non-delegation doctrine. And the non-delegation doctrine provides that in a democracy, if you elect an official, the one thing that one thing that the official can never do is is give any part of that power to someone else to a private group. You can't sell it, and you can't give it away because the voters have given you a position of responsibility. It's a sacred trust, and you have to keep it. And it is your job to make those decisions. That basic principle is reflected in the United States Constitution in several places, but the one that's most relevant here is something called the Guarantee Clause in Article 4, which provides as follows, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. Now, you recall from school that, that a republican form of government means that you elect somebody not to do whatever you say, but to act on their best judgment on behalf of the common good. That's the point. You elect people for a fixed period of years, you can't pull them back immediately, so that they have time to act on their best judgment. They have two years or four years or whatever the term of office is to do their best for the public using their own judgment. Madison talked about the, it's called the Guarantee Clause, he talked about it extensively in the constitutional debate. <coughs> And he said the point of the Guarantee Clause is to make sure that no, no official who is elected will give over any part of the power to any aristocrats or nobles. We don't want to go back to that in our news. Or, quote, or to any, quote, favored class. So think about what's happened here. We have uh, a legislature passing a law saying you must do collective bargaining with the unions and other laws that give them controls over that prevents you from getting rid of a lousy teacher or a rogue cop or managing pensions in a reasonable way. They have a veto on daily decisions. Uh, none of the tools of management are available. They've given the veto of democracy to, to the public unions. So, so I think this situation sort of in the sense of crisis is a violation of the Guarantee Clause. So it's a violation for state legislatures to give powers to the unions. Uh, it's a violation of the United States Constitution. Now, there is a step that has to be taken to win this lawsuit. I talk about it in the which is the Supreme Court has actually never decided a case under the Guarantee Clause. There have only been four cases ever brought about it. They've all involved political questions like which uh, competing form of a constitution in Rhode Island is more Republican than the other. And the Supreme Court said those are political questions that ought to be decided by voters or by the legislature. They shouldn't be decided by the Supreme Court. And so it's been sort of accepted wisdom that the Guarantee Clause is the word is non-justiciable, that it needs to be solved politically. But as I explain in the book, the public unions do not have a practical political solution because they've harnessed the mass of good government against the reform of, of, of big government. And, and what we're talking about here is not a political question, it's an operational question. 
Who is supposed to have authority over the school system? The person we elect. Who's supposed to have authority over the transit system? Who's supposed to have authority to run government? The unions or these other people? Well, that's not political. It doesn't matter what party you're in. The, the, the person elected is supposed to have that authority. So I feel reasonably comfortable that even though this case has never been brought, that in this situation, that it has a lot of validity. And when the book came out, the book came out at the end of January, it really didn't get many reviews for a couple of weeks. And the Wall Street Journal turned out an op-ed by me. And I said, yeah, that's sort of odd. You know, I think this would be red meat. And I think what happened is that people just thought it was too good to be true. You know, <laughs> you know, you know how could, if, if it could really unconstitutional? Come on. I mean, we've been accepting this for 50 years. And then legal scholars started looking at it and started writing. Somebody from the Federal Society started looking at it, started writing reviews, and said, wait a minute, this is actually quite serious. Let's think about it. This emperor has no clothes. They've taken over the operations of government. Well, how can that be legal? And so, um, so I also make another constitutional argument, which, as I say in the book, there's no basis for in constitutional law, but I think it's nonetheless right, which is that public unions organizing against the public interest is a breach of their fiduciary duty of loyalty. Uh, they, they swear an oath, senior officials and others, they all have a duty, a fiduciary duty, to serve the public. And without any room for reasonable disagreement, these contracts do nothing but harm the government. You would be hard pressed to find in a 400 page collective bargaining agreement any provision that's in the public interest. We're talking about feather bedding, controls, embedded inefficiencies that are designed to be inefficient. And the MTA, if the work crew sees an overhanging branch they need to cut on the transit line, they can't cut it. You have to bring in a new work crew under the union rules. Is that in the public interest? No, it's just it's completely because the, um, the MTA had to clean, thought it had to clean the subways, was sanitized them during COVID. So they didn't have enough workers to do it. So they brought in contractors. They brought in contractors to sanitize the subway cars. The contractors did three times the work of the, uh, than the public employees following the rules. They didn't have to comply with the work rules. So we're talking about, you know, there are 10 million books written on management. How to have, be a good manager. You go to, I can't, I can't, who buys these books? You go to the airport, <laughs> you know. And, I mean, the last thing I want to do is sitting on a plane for hours is to read a management book. Anyway, so there are all these management books. There is not one book of the 10 million about what happens when you can't manage. <laughs> Think about it. It's like, it's like having a, a, you know, a, a cart where the spokes are disconnected from the hub. What's the inefficiency of not being able to manage something? I mean, a lot of business people here. Is it 50%? Is it 70%? I mean, it's some incredible number. So, so the system is really, it, it, it's a scandal. It's a scandal we've accepted because we've lived with it for so long. But it shouldn't make it less of a scandal. Every public dollar involves a moral choice. If we waste a public dollar here, it's not available to do some public good somewhere else. It's a scandal. So let's just rewind the clock for a second. The unions got this bargaining power 50 years ago by arguing that it was elementary justice that they should be treated exactly the same as people in like the car workers union, trade unions and industrial unions. That was the argument, and people sort of bought it. Well, it turns out that the differences between public employee unions and trade unions are not differences in degree. They're actually differences in kind. A, um, if a trade union argued for inefficient work rules, the company would go out of business or move out of town, and everyone would lose their jobs. Government can't move out of town. What do the trade unions bargain over? They basically bargain over dividing the, the pie of profit 
between capital and labor. It's just the narrow, they're not bargaining over running the company. They're bargaining over just some share of the profit. There's no profit in government, so what are they bargaining over? Whatever they can get away with. Power, money, controls, future pensions. Again, there's no limit because government can't, can't move out of town. But the biggest difference is that in the private sector, if management colluded with labor to come up with some sort of sweetheart deal or something, they'd be thrown into jail. That's unlawful. In the public sector, that's how the game works. The public unions get million, they get $5 billion a year in dues total, most spent for political activity. In a typical gubernatorial race in a big state, they'll spend tens of millions of dollars to get a governor elected. In New Jersey recently, staffed, union members staffed the governor's campaign office. They bust loads of union members, man the phone banks, knock on doors. They are a machine like nothing the country has ever seen. And then the collective bargaining agreement comes up. They don't sit on the other side of the table. They sit on the same side of the table. It's not a negotiation. It's a payoff. That's what it is. It's a payoff. In the private sector, if you owe a fiduciary duty to um, any group, your shareholders, you're running a business, your shareholders to some other group, and somebody comes up to you and says, I'll give you a lot of money if you give me special favors instead, you get thrown into jail. Well, that's what's happened to democracy. People didn't understand that public unions not only do they have a, and they have a, and they have a duty of fiduciary duty. So you have these people who have a duty of fiduciary duty harnessing the mass of big government against the reform of big government and spending billions of dollars to do it. 10% of the delegates to the last Democratic National Convention, members of the teachers union. So they can't touch it. So 150 years ago, we had the problem of the spoil system. Uh, and the problem was that people who gave political donations got jobs, even if they were inept. It was basically buying jobs. And it was terrible because government didn't work very well. And it was a big movement to, to, to reform it and create the civil service system. So what do we have now? We have a system where people give money in order to get and keep jobs, no matter how badly they do, except instead of changing when a party in power changes, this particular branch of the spoil system is permanent. Democracy can't work. It can't operate. You know, we, we, most of us talk, argue about policy stuff, you know, immigration, climate change. Just look at the operation. It can't operate. And the Democrats can't do anything about it because they're in the pocket of these unions. So, is there another party? There is another party, not the Democrats, that has never actually tried to assume the mantle of good government, but guess what? Along with everything else, the Republicans could because the Democrats won't take this on. Democracy can't work, it can't deliver goods, it's squandering money, and the solution is to break this stranglehold. And that's, I think, the worthy cause that I, and now with Sally and others' help, are trying to advance. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. A lot to think about. I was trying to think, did the teachers' union get collective, the teachers get collective bargaining in, what, 1974? In around California, no, no, it was earlier, 68 or 69. Now, okay. around the country. I remember Peter no, Brimelow. It was state by state. Peter Brimelow wrote, wrote a great article in Fortune, probably in the late 80s, called The Worm and the Apple. And it was all about the NEA. And he quoted Al Shanker, who was head of the AFT at the time, who said, when, when parents start paying union dues, I'll start worrying about parents. So it's really, the whole thing is a scandal. And we're now seeing, I think, some exciting things happening in the school choice uh, movement in the state. So anyway, um, Philip has agreed kindly to answer some questions. So I'm going to move over. And Philip, please raise your hand. John Seiler. And uh, I have two questions. One is, I was talking with John Cox and John Moore over there. 
And they, they had this massive spending by uh, the against them, of course, as you know about that. But the, the other problem is that the, the billionaires in the state, or the billionaires, are not giving much to them. So is there a solution to that? How can we get these, these millionaires and billionaires to, to donate? And the second question is, uh, why not go back to spoil systems? It wasn't that great, it's better than this. <laughs> Well, you know, there, there actually is a really interesting uh, book written by a guy whose name I may remember, I may not, on, the, on Tammany Hall and the spoil system. And it was actually surprisingly semi-effective. You know, if the public really wanted something, there was someone in charge. Whereas the thing about public unions, it's all negative. It's all about veto. No, you can't do it. It's not actually about doing anything. So it's, it's that much worse. You're right that as to the millionaires and billionaires, um, <laughs> um, we, um, I was just talking to a friend of mine who's a professor at UC Irvine this morning about this. Uh, um, we actually don't have much of a culture now of, of, uh, of, of civic leadership by the people who used to be the, you know, the captains of industry and that sort of thing. I mean, there, there are exceptions to that, but, but by and large. And, and, and you, we can't, not just unions, but other problems, the embedded um, bureaucracies of the last 50 or 60 years that, that where you can't give a, get a permit to build a transmission line or, or where, the, where the housing for the homeless in Los Angeles costs one unit costs $700,000 because of the building codes and you don't allow SRO you know, where, where the homeless used to live and such. So, so there are all these codes that are just piled up like sediment in the harbor that really need to get rebooted. And, um, and that's going to require the leadership, I think, of the business community, of the, you know, people to say, say, the business of government doesn't work. And we need not to get rid of government, but for whatever it's going to do, we need to make it be, be effective. So I agree it's a problem, but... Let, let me know when you find the people. I, I'm a, uh, an attorney. I ran for school board last year against an incumbent who works for the CTA. <laughs> and I would like to know, I asked our school board two years ago if she should be allowed to be on the school board because it presents a conflict of interest. She votes for her own races. They said no. Is there a legal path to kick the thousands of members of the CTA off the school board? Or uh, the I mean, yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, uh, the, uh, the teachers unions have had a, uh, a crusade over the last 25 or 30 years to be, take over the school boards. And they, um, they, they have, they have uh, uh, leadership academies, you know, where they, where they recruit people and stuff. And then so they're, so, so that, you know, the foxes are running the hen house sort of thing. Um, yes, we can talk about that. I mean, I didn't talk about that in the book, but it is a conflict of interest. And... Um, it's a little harder argument, but but no, it's worth. I mean, it's worth. You know, it's worth talking about. So. I retired out of Los Angeles County Department of Health and Services like 37 years on the job, and I remember back then we had no choice. It was all unionized. I was in a relatively small job classification, so we were coordinated with all you know the therapists, the nursing was separate. But in the course of doing it, other people would say, don't worry, I'll talk to you, I got you. Right. But guess what? Everybody else got hot. My job has to be who got at one percent. Right. So I figured out that I had to get in the bargain for my job classification. The more uh, when deeply entrenched I got, the more I saw, the more I was telling myself, boy, this is very crooked. And then my friends who were teachers, I found out that a past mayor who basically stood off all these dollars so he could upgrade the mayoral yacht for all of his womanizing activity, went to the teachers unions and said, if you vote for me, I will automatically increase your pensions by 6%. There you are. Well, he did it. That was a lot of years ago. And so, like, of course, the stock market never lived up.
Right. So this one person, I feel, is ultimately responsible for three bad <coughs> self-centered decisions. But of course, everyone's going to blame the teachers. Right, right. So that's where that all came from. Yeah, yeah. And then we have other problems, too, because the new person in the role in our yeah. county came out of health care as well. And let me tell you, you got to wonder how she got where she was. It's not pretty. Right, right, right. It's an insider's game. John? Yeah, uh, not to depress anybody else even more in this room about this, <laughs> but it's even worse than what you say because the incentive structure is completely the opposite of what you'd find in a private sector because the more public employees there are, the more dues they collect. So the idea of big government growing is just written into public sector unions. And, and oh, 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 clearly. I mean, again, these contracts are, are, are feather bedding contracts. I mean, you just want, there, there was a, a tunnel built for the 2nd Avenue subway a few years ago in New York. It was not a, it was a, it's not, it's a, it's a union favoritism story, not so much a public union story. It cost two and a half billion dollars a mile. It turned out that France had recently done a similar tunnel using the same machine. And France is not known for its efficient work rules. It cost 500 million dollars a mile, one-fifth as much. And it turned, there, the New York Times did a big story about it. They had five times as many people operating the machine as was required. In this, in is what do we do about it? I mean, you know, and declare it unconstitutional. I uh, speak to the possibilities of the Supreme Court over, you know, agreeing with you that the constitutionality is. Uh, um, you, you know, I'm friendly with some of the Supreme Court justices, so I'm uh, in my my job when I work for a living uh, was <laughs> my job when I work for a living was was as an appellate lawyer. So mm -hmm. I did Supreme Court cases and that sort of thing. So I'm. Um, uh, in my books, basically, are appellate briefs written for real people. Uh, but the, um, yeah, I, I, I think the Supreme, again, it took people, taking people for a while for it to sink in. Harvard, uh, a Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy is doing a written symposium on the arguments in this book next month. Uh, I mean, you know, this is serious. These are really, see, democracy cannot work under these constraints. It is, this is an irrefutable fact. Professor Howard, um, you have a lot of people in this room that have serious scars. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe uh, that's why we're excited about your book. Um, and having read it. <clears throat> and reviewed it quite well. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you for the compliment. He's a very, very good writer. I know he's a bad personality, but he's a really good writer. <laughs> you only had two success stories. Right, that's right. And so I had to fly out of LAX the day that Ronald Reagan uh, fired all the air control uh, tower workers, and I had to fly a smaller plane up to a client up north. So I, I remember that day too vividly. So that was a good story, and then we talked about Scott Walker and what he did in Wisconsin, and since I have a son-in-law that was born there and grew up there, uh, we've become very intimate with that state and with that governor. Uh, but, but since writing the book, have you found any other? No, of course not. I mean, it's not, no, it's not, no, take Ambien. No, there's, um, uh, there's, the unions are brutal. If you, um, you all know this, we've crossed them, but if you're a state legislator who decides you want to do some kind of modest reform of the union prerogatives, there's a, and you start getting a little traction, national union money will come behind and completely cream you. In the case of Scott Walker, it's worth remembering Scott Walker didn't run on the basis of overhaul, getting rid of most of the union controls because he never would have gotten elected if he had. He got the, he, it looked like he lined up the votes. He had a, you know, Republican majority in the state legislature. Um, the unions 
had a demonstration. They actually invaded the Capitol uh, uh, in, in Madison, Wisconsin, of 100,000 people to protest the proposed law. All the Democratic le legislators left the state so they wouldn't have a quorum at the vote. Uh, he nonetheless got it through. Within a year, the unions had harnessed tens of millions of dollars to mount a recall election to get Scott Walker out of office. That was bitterly fought, took over, took the better part of a year, tens of millions of dollars on both sides. Walker won. Then the unions got a friendly Democratic DA to indict Walker for campaign finance violations in financing the recall election. And that was sustained initially until it was finally overturned by the Wisconsin Supreme Court. It took four years for him to win the battle, and his scars were such that it really kind of ruined his you know, political career. So uh, it, the solution here is not literally impossible in every jurisdiction to buck the unions, but, but the right solution here is constitutional. So on that note, um, given this hypothetical Supreme Court case focused on the guarantee clause, um, what would your ideal plaintiff look like? There's a lot of elected Right, right. The ideal plaintiff would look like you. It would be, <laughs> it would be, we would win. Oh my God, we would win. Can you imagine? <laughs> we, okay, um, the ideal. The ideal plaintiff would be a elected, um, an elected official. It could be, uh, it could be a school board if it's a board rather than a. Because it's a, it could be a uh, a mayor. It could be a governor. Uh, we're looking into whether it could be actually a senior official of something who has a, who has a designated clear responsibility on the governing structure to run something. Who's lost their powers, so they might. Be, be a plaintiff too. Um, so we're, um, uh, the Illinois lawsuit is actually doesn't require one of the one challenging the constitutionality is um, 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 I think they think that the that, that taxpayers groups can bring that lawsuit for a variety of reasons. But, but basically if you can find, we're really actively looking for some Officials, so that if you can find a mayor, um, a, a, a school board, you know, you know, or some like that, would be really fantastic. And we'll find the, with your help, but we'll find the the the, the lawyers and put together a legal team and and bring the claims. And the claims should be brought in different states, in part because it's actually good in getting the Supreme Court to have different rulings. You know, it's, it's, it's a, uh, so the Ninth Circuit, we'd lose that because it's the Ninth Circuit, right? California, I have a son-in-law who clerked on the Ninth Circuit, so he could tell me why we're going to lose. But the, um, anyway, that's the... Oh, Jeff? Yeah, you know, there is a, a, a recent little bit of a gain, and we'll see where that goes, but just about an hour east of here, we have the Temecula uh, School District. And what they did is, you've been evangelical, really got behind them, a lot of the money, but a lot of work went in. In other words, a union type almost thing, and they took three out of the five uh, on the board of trustees. So, and they're changing things yeah. really good. So we'll see where that goes, but there are these little ones. Like I say, Walker had, you know, the Koch brothers and a lot of big money behind them to fight that off. So I think the thing I'm getting is, it's going to take the best legal teams, obviously, but those also take a lot of money. Yeah. And, and also a lot of, uh, I'd say, uh, PR on getting the, the public on our side instead of the old, hey, yeah. I want to be fair, the treat is right, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, let's pause there for a second because I'm not, I mean, the money, I'm not so worried about. Um, I mean, you have to raise it. But the PR aspect is really important because people... So one of the virtues, I hope, of this book is it will make people think about something they've taken for granted, you know, in a different way. And, and it should be turned into a scandal. And the best way for it to turn into a scandal is for word of mouth, you know, people like you telling your friends, whatever. But also, and I'm starting to talk with some of the 
um, the aspirants for the Republican nomination in 2024, to get some people on that sort of platform talking about this. So if we can make it into an issue into the, in the debates that, that government can't be run anymore, then all of a sudden people begin to understand that it's not like a trade union, it's completely different, that, that it's using up half or more of taxpayers' dollars for no good reason, with lousy schools where not one kid is proficient in reading. So, so uh, why don't you think that the Janus decision caught fire among uh, union workers? Um, why didn't the, the Janus decision was was a Supreme Court decision in 2018 that um, uh, held that it was unconstitutional to require non-union members to pay agency dues to the union. So that was bulking up the union coffers with people who didn't want to belong to the union. And the, the Supreme Court held that that was a violation of the First Amendment because it was taking their money to use for unions' political speech. Um, most of the jurisdictions uh, that I, most of the situations I've heard about have made it very hard to inform union members that they have this right. There's a law in New Jersey that says if anyone tells a, a union member or a prospective union member that they don't have an obligation that the school district will be liable to the union for its dues. Literally. So, so they have these crazy things where they're, where they're basically trying to keep it, you know, it's peer group pressure and all that sort of stuff. I know that there are groups in California that are actually uh, aggressively uh, working to inform people that they have these rights to get them done. But the, uh, and it's had some effect, but not, not huge. Am I correct? History that uh, today New York City leads the world in paying teachers not to teach. That there are many teachers in New York City that actually go to an auditorium or something and just play games or read books because they're deemed to be too un unhelpful in the classroom that they just pay them not to teach. Right. Well, do they lead? Does New York City lead the world in paying teachers not to teach and putting them what used to be known as rubber rooms and now they don't call them that anymore? Um, um, well, it depends on what you mean paying not to teach, because there are a lot of teachers who are in the classroom who don't teach either. Um, but, um, but yes, because the union, so in New York City, for example, a cocaine dealer who was convicted, a teacher who was a cocaine dealer, was convicted, went to jail, came out, under the union rules, he was required to be rehired by the school system. I mean, that's an example of how, 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 how little accountability there is. Yeah, um, Mark and Chris, I loved your book. I nailed it. Um, I, I've had experience working in Sacramento uh, against the union, so I totally agree with everything. Have you thought about a documentary as a PR? There's so many unbelievable stories about this issue that I think it would not take that much to put a documentary on YouTube. Well, I think that's a, actually, so uh, Alex Marino, who's a friend of mine who used to write for The Daily Show, is here because he's going to make Sally funnier and he's going to, and he's going to give me ideas on, uh, on, on what kinds of products um, we, we can create like that. The Illinois Policy Institute just did a, a documentary on the, on the public unions in Illinois who really have run the state for a long time. Um, uh, I, I'm ashamed to say I haven't watched it yet, uh, but, but in any event, it's supposed to be pretty good. But yes, we ought to create products. And, the, and, I, and I think the more I talk about this, the more the product has to include the origin story and how, how, how trade unions, how industrial unions are about sharing the profit and they, and they never can make the, the thing work inefficiently. And public unions are all about making it work inefficiently and paying people off to get the benefits. I mean, that, that difference is just not one that people understand. And once people get that difference, then they're no longer for the public unions. And, and frankly, other public unions, I mean, like the, the poor bus drivers in LA, you know, they're, they're fighting for the leftovers. So.
If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.